Hello. Today for our mini lecture, I've decided to do an old-fashioned chalk talk, and I'm trying to get a little bit better with my drawing skills, so I've tried to add a little bit of dimensionality to our membrane. Now, you could envision that this was the cytoplasmic membrane of an E. coli cell, in which case we would envision the periplasmic space out here, and I'll challenge you to think about what's in that periplasmic space. Now, we are going to be thinking about how molecules get into and out of a cell. Transport, that is. Now, we remember our analogy that we could think about the membrane as being very exclusive. That is like the bouncer at a very fancy dance club. It only lets certain things get in and certain things get out. Now, if it happens to be something small of low molecular weight, like oxygen that is hydrophobic, nonpolar, and tiny, it's able to get into the cell very easily. So something like molecular oxygen, it can diffuse across the membrane. Now, we know that it does so in response to its concentration gradient. So if there is a lot more oxygen out here than inside the cell, then we know that diffusion will follow that gradient from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. Now that's also true for more polar molecules. For example, we could think about the water molecule, which we know H2O to be a more polar molecule than oxygen. So with that overall dipole moment, we know it's a lot less likely to diffuse across the membrane via free diffusion or simple passive diffusion, but that it, that it um, may be in higher concentration on one side of the cell or another. So what it needs is it needs a transporter. It needs something to allow it to come into the cell. So unlike these small, tiny molecules that can diffuse freely without a transporter, it requires something that we call an aquaporin. So that means that this particular transporter, an integral membrane protein, provides a red carpet, so to speak. It is, is providing a polar region in the center of the molecule that the water can diffuse down its concentration gradient following that nice region of polarity where like dissolves like. So this is a facilitated diffusion transporter. Let's write that down. So whereas simple passive or free diffusion is being used here, when there's a transporter used, for um, passive transport going down a concentration gradient where there's more water out here than in here, then this is facilitated diffusion because it's facilitated by a transporter. So facilitated diffusion. So facilitated diffusion of is, is of two types. There's channels and there's carriers. Now channels pretty much allow the molecule outside at the higher concentration gradient to just swoosh right in. There's not a whole lot of specific binding and conformational change. A large and charged ion is going to have a hard time obviously passing by free simple diffusion so it's going to require a facilitated diffusion transporter, but it's actually specifically going to require, in most cases, a carrier. So the difference in a carrier is that when the potassium ion binds to the specific facilitated diffusion transporter, there's a very specific binding site for it. It, it really conforms. And, and binds in a very loving, coddling kind of way around this particular molecule. It conforms to it. And then as it fills the amino acids up here in the top, as they fill this binding, they start to move and change their orientation. And they wiggle all the way down until they open up this region through which the ion can pass. So there's actually a conformational change that occurs here. 
So we can see this open to accommodate the molecule and then there's a region through which it can pass into the cell. Now, as you might guess, a carrier where it has to conform to and transport the molecule that way is going to have a backlog. If there's a ton of potassium ions out here and they're all hanging out, very much wanting to go down their concentration gradient, they're going to have to wait on this one until the carrier literally wraps around and conforms to and transfers that particular ion. So it's going to be um, a waiting line. There's going to be a waiting line for transport through that carrier. So unlike a channel where, say, that water molecule is just and there are many of them, and they all just get on in through that open polar region, the potassium ion is going to have to wait in line. So those of you mathematicians out there, you're going to realize that there's a different function for a channel or free diffusion like that oxygen molecule that just across the membrane. We can draw those functions. So if we're looking at the rate as a function of the concentration gradient, we can draw that on a set of axes. Always good to label your y and your x axis. So we're looking again at rate of transport as a function of the concentration gradient And now we know so far we've just talked about passive transport where molecules are moving from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So we know that the more concentration gradient is, the faster the rate will be. So when we started by looking at free, simple, passive diffusion, we know that as the concentration gradient gets greater, the rate gets greater. And this is a linear function. But if we turn our attention from the simple passive free diffusion or the diffusion via channels, so this is more like what channels uh, resemble. So if we said this is simple passive free diffusion, This is what more what we would see for channels because they're just right through. There not isn't a lot of conformational change needing to take place. Um, so this would also be more like what we would see of channels. Ooh, getting aggressive with that talk. But if we started to take a look then instead at our carriers where they have to make that conformational change, we see that when there is a waiting line for getting in that transporter, that means that at some concentration high enough, the um, transporter can't go any faster. So it's saturated. So our function starts to look like this. It's a more hyperbolic, saturable function, where at some point as the concentration gets high enough, we see that the rate begins to saturate because there's literally a backup or a waiting line. I like to say that whereas channels are more like water passing through a colander, it just passes right through it without much rate deterrence, a, a carrier is more like a ship going through a lock where if you've ever seen that happen, the lock has to um, bring in the one ship at a time, lower that ship to the, the next level, and then let it out. There's a conformational change. And if there are other ships that want to go through the lock, they have to wait in line. So this is saturable. Let's recap. We've talked so far about only one kind of transport. This is passive transport, where no energy is required. Molecules are simply moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. 
Now, we've talked about a couple of different types. First, we looked at free diffusion, where a molecule that is of low molecular weight and is nonpolar can just flit right across the membrane and move in the direction of its concentration from high to low. We have also looked at facilitated diffusion and recall that we had two types, channels which approach the free simple passive diffusion, but they provide a um, region of polarity for the molecules to travel in. So they're very different from the other type carriers which have to undergo a formidable conformational change to adapt to the molecule that they're transporting. Now, a good example of a channel is an aquaporin or a glycerol aquaporin. We call these sort of transporters major intrinsic proteins or MIPs. Now, carriers some examples of that include what we call the potassium uptake systems, though those are, are still being very much typified and studied. Now, you might notice that our number two big one is missing. That is the type of transport that requires energy. Active transport. Because microbial cells have a harder time controlling the environment in which they're found, they have a tendency towards using quite a lot of active transport. I'll challenge you to think about why that might be different in a large eukaryotic multicellular organism like us. Let's take a look at some active transporters. Remember, these are the transporters that take molecules from a region of low concentration. So maybe there is a molecule out here that is in relatively small concentration compared to its concentration inside of the cell, but perhaps this cell very much wants to concentrate that particular molecule inside. So let's begin with the first kind of active transporter that we call primary active transport. Primary active transport. Now you guessed it, these, are, these transporters are tapping into ATP, baby. They are transporting using that universal energy currency. So on our ATP binding cassette transporter, oh, let's write that out. ATP binding cassette. We don't ever call them by that full mouthful of a name. We call them A, B, C transporters. So A, B, C transporters have a region inside that is the ATP hydrolyzing domain. So that means just what you think it would mean. That's the domi domain that hydrolyzes ATP or breaks down the high energy bond in ATP to generate the energy needed to bring in this molecule. So ATP at this domain will be hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate to power the influx of this little blue molecule. Now there are two ATP hydrolyzing domains and what we see is that in the periplasmic space, if this is an E. coli cell, we see that this molecule called the carrier molecule picks up this little blue molecule and then takes it to the ABC transporter. The ATP is hydrolyzed and it brings in the entire thing, the carrier molecule and the little blue molecule. I like to think of this carrier molecule as kind of being the limousine for the little blue molecule. That little blue molecule can't come in all by itself. The ABC transporter will not conform to it, and therefore it needs this limousine to help chauffeur it into the cell. Now, ABC transporters are ridiculously famous. We're going to talk about them today in your in-class activities. However, one note I will make about them is that they can transport a variety of things, ranging from amino acids, organic acids, to things like sugars. However, also important is to note that they are ubiquitous across the domains of life. And it's also interesting to note that sometimes an ABC transporter starts doing unexpected things. For example, in multiple drug-resistant E. coli, 
an ABC transporter sometimes turns itself on backwards and it begins using this transporter instead of to bring in necessary molecules to pump out the drugs that it doesn't want to get treated by. That is to pump out the antibiotics so that it'll be safe in the presence of antibiotics. So that can be a source of resistance. Awesome. More conversation about ABC transporters later. Let's take a minute to look at secondary active transport. Secondary active transport. In secondary active transport, something besides ATP is used. In fact, something that we know a lot about as well, a gradient. For example, the PMF. So the proton ion gradient which we know to be in much higher concentration in the periplasmic safe space than inside of the cell, because you guessed it, E. coli has an electron transport chain. So this can be actually tapped into to power secondary active transport. So let's say that this is a secondary active transporter right here. And let's make ourselves some room to see what it does. So we know this proton ion gradient is going to power the influx of another molecule. So that other molecule potentially could be a sugar. In fact, the lactose permease is one famous uh, secondary active transporter in E. coli. As a group, these secondary active transporters are called the major facilitator superfamily. So what will happen is that this hydrogen ion gradient, a hydrogen ion, will bind to the transporter. That will trigger conformational changes within the transporter. It will change in some way in its orientation of its subunits. They will adjust a little bit, enabling the binding of another molecule. Then when that changes with the binding of the second molecule, this opens up a pore in which the hydrogen ion and the second molecule can swoosh on in. So let's see how beautifully we can do that. Both of them simultaneously into the cell. You might be guessing that this particular secondary active transporter is, you got it, a SIM port. Simport, sim, meaning same. These go in the same direction. We can also see secondary active transporters that are antiports, where in fact the ion may swish in and the molecule may swish out, depending upon what the cell needs. Sometimes cells will also concentrate using a hydrogen ion gradient. They may concentrate a sodium ion gradient, and then that sodium ion gradient may be used to power secondary active transport. Let's talk about another kind of active transport called group translocation. Group translocation. Now, it's just like it sounds. A group is added onto a molecule as it's getting translocated. So say we have a glucose molecule this glucose molecule, as it's getting transported into the cell, gets modified by getting a phosphoryl group added onto it. So this glucose becomes glucose with a phosphoryl group added onto it, and we'll talk more about the details of that later, but it becomes modified by this, this phosphorylation event. Now, you might be thinking, where does this enzyme on the inside, the cytosolic region of this group translocator, get its high energy phosphoryl group? Good question. It gets it from a super high energy molecule inside of the cell, one that we're going to meet later. This is called phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP for short. Now, PP isn't ATP, but I tell you what, it's got a heck of a lot more energy than ATP and plenty of energy that it could be worthy of ATP. So this PP gets consumed, and in fact, this PEP transfers its phosphoryl group on it onto an enzyme called E1, and then E1 becomes phosphorylated 
And that phosphorylation makes E1 high in energy, but E1 is not the enzyme here that we see E2B um, being the phosphorylator of glucose. So E2, E1, phosphorylated E1, transfers its phosphoryl group yet again onto another molecule. This molecule is called HPR. HPR takes on the high energy phosphoryl group and it's not done though. It transfers that phosphoryl group and it transfers that phosphoryl group. Let's make us some room here. It transfers that phosphoryl group onto an enzyme called E2A. And E2A becomes phosphorylated. And then finally, E2A transfers its phosphoryl group onto E2B, which can then give it to glucose. Wicked. Yeah.